Hey, it's time for Monday Motivation, 12 o'clock noon Eastern time in the place to be. It's Remar Review. And if you are studying for the NCLEX, this is the best place for you to start your journey, be on your journey, and ultimately in your journey and pass the exam. My name is Regina Callion. I am so happy to be here with you all today, uh, the number one NCLEX instructor on the planet. And also, you will like to know that our NCLEX questions today will be very difficult, very challenging management of care questions. We got a lot going on. This is a pop quiz. Um, so much going on <laughs> here. Hey, I am not only super excited to be here with you guys, but I am also bringing you the NCLEX virtual trainer, virtual trainer. Um, newly released this year to help you pass your NCLEX exam. And, 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 and if you or yourself know someone who has the VT, then guess what? I know you heard about its awesomeness and how it brings the content to you in a simple and straightforward for manner. And I know you guys appreciate that. Hey, I got a testimonial for you. I got a testimonial for you right here. It simply, it simply says, oh yes, oh yes, Regina, I did, uh, wait, she said, oh yes, I did Regina with VT, uh, or I did Regina with VT, and quick facts, first try, international nurse, 76 questions, you are God sent Regina and Mark. Let's throw Mark in there too. Um, hello everyone, Monique from Indianapolis. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are from. Also, I have a free book alert for you guys. I have a free book alert for you. Don't forget that we have Love Your Content coming up and the workbook has indeed been released. The workbook has indeed been released. So I hope that you guys have your copy download it, print it, ready to go. It is a physical copy for this book and it's a physical copy for this book. And remember that this is what you will use during those lectures, okay? So you wanna have this printed out and this has uh, all your worksheets. This is free, this is free, you need to have it. Um, so it has your worksheets in it that we'll be going over for the two day review. And it also has the homework questions as well. The homework questions as well right here. So again, this is what it looks like. It's the love your content event that we have coming up. Here are the details. If you haven't heard of it before, here they are. It is February 12th and 13th, 8 p.m. Eastern time right here. Facebook, YouTube, the broadcast will be totally free. It's a free broadcast. Um, and we are going to go over sexually transmitted diseases, pregnancy and childbearing uh, labor. I'm also going to take you into the virtual trainer, all right, which currently is on sale right now for $169. Crazy, insane price. Um, I don't even have to tell you guys that because the way people are jumping into the virtual trainer just lets me know that it is indeed the truth. All right. Um, I got a testimonial it says, Hey, Jennifer says, You have a calling. You and your husband touch us spiritually and mentally. Oh my goodness, I love you. I passed NCLEX PN with all 205 questions. Quick Facts is the truth. Uh, read it three times. Yes, I, I, I appreciate that. Quick Facts uh, Quick Facts is the book that every nursing student should have. I personally love this book. It goes everywhere. Anytime I leave the state, the country, wherever, I take Quick Facts with me. Um, so you get Quick Facts if you get the virtual trainer. You also get the virtual trainer workbook. Hey, how about we do some NCLEX questions? I'm ready. I have some really challenging ones for you guys today. I I'm not gonna take it easy on you because you know, you gotta know this management of care, PNs, you gotta know coordinated care. So give these ones a try. This is what we're talking about today. Management of care. Remember, NCLEX virtual trainer on sale right now, $169 while supplies last. Question number one simply says this. The nurse has been named in a lawsuit concerning a wrongful death claim. Which action should the nurse take first? All right, here we go. I'm going to read it again. <clears throat> the nurse has been named in a 
lawsuit concerning a wrongful death claim. Which action should the nurse take first? Is it number one, consult the hospital's two, review the client's chart to gather information, three, purchase personal liability insurance, or four, discuss the case with the supervisor. Oh, this is a good one. I know you guys have not been in this situation. But I see one, I see two, I see four. You have all different kinds of answers going on. Write your answer, smash that share button. Let's go read more nurses. Okay, so the answers are coming in. You guys are doing a fantastic job. The hardest part is just showing up all right, and participating. So the correct answer actually for this question, it may surprise you, but the correct answer is to, the nurse needs to review that client's chart to gather information. This is the most appropriate thing for that nurse to do because guess what? She has been named in a lawsuit. So before she speaks to anybody, she needs to know, hey, what do I remember about this client? It was a wrongful death claim. I need to look at this client's chart. How was I involved? What do I, we have to assess, we have to gather information. And so this really doesn't change here. Let's look at the other choices and let's kind of break them down. So the first one that I think it could have been, the first one that is the most reasonable out of all of the other wrong choices is number one. So that was a good distractor. Consult with the hospital's attorney. That's a good action. The nurse should do that. But before she speaks to the attorney, she wants to know where does she stand? What does she remember? Okay. All right. Um, because the hospital's attorney could be working for her or what against her. All right. Um, and so this is why it's very important for the nurse to know what she is speaking about because just because no, 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 no. Just because, and I'm going to explain it more for people are saying, people are saying, uh, but the attorney's job is to gather the information. All right. Let me tell you guys something about your license. When you when you are being um, accused of malpractice of some sort, it is up to you to have an attorney to protect your license. The hospital's attorney does not always cover the nurse, right? And I preached this before to you guys about, about why it's so important for nurses to carry their own professional liability insurance. If you have a nursing license, you should have insurance to protect your license, to protect yourself. And I was telling you guys about my policy that I have. It is literally, it's super cheap. I have like um, uh, about a million dollars of personal liability insurance on my license and it's like $99 a year. So this is something that you have to understand as a matter of your professional process, okay? Because the hospitals don't always defend the employees, especially if indeed they are correct that the nurse did in fact wrongfully harm a patient. The nurses, the, the hospital is not going to spend millions of dollars to protect somebody who was in the wrong. All right. So this is why the best action for the nurse to do is gather information about this client. Three, per purchase personal liability insurance. Well, the thing about that is that has to be done before you get accused of something. All right. You cannot retroactively purchase this and say, well, can you cover me? Nobody wants to do that. It's kind of like car insurance. You have to have it before the accident, before the accident occurs. All right. Um, here we go. Four, discuss the case with the charge nurse. No. And I saw a lot of people pick this and they said, uh, you know, it seems like it makes sense, but actually the nurse should not discuss this case with anybody else. All right. Nobody else involved because all of these things can be used against you. You could be, you know, accused of intimidating the, the other people. Like, so you have to, you, you have to be very strict about how you, about your per professional demeanor. And so if I, 
am accused of something malpractice, I cannot call my nurse manager, my coworkers and say, girl, you know, they didn't accuse me. What you think about that? Or what did I do wrong? Did you see me do something wrong? You know what I mean? So you really have to maintain a very, um, a very rigid, rigid act to follow. Okay. All right. So that was number one. This is tough. I like, I like these kind of questions because they do cause us to think and hopefully we're breaking it down. We're breaking it down. Um, let's try another one. Shall we? All right, people, here we go. Question number two, the charge nurse notices that one of the staffs take frequent breaks. They have late arrivals for shifts and often volunteers to care for clients who require narcotics, which priority action should the charge nurse implement regarding this employee? Okay, so we have the situation. The charge nurse notices that one of the staff, they take frequent breaks, they have late arrivals for the shift, and they often volunteer to care for clients who require narcotics. Which priority action should the charge nurse implement regarding this employee? Is it number one, discuss the nurse's actions with the unit manager. Two, confront the nurse about the behavior. Three, do not allow the nurse to take breaks alone. Or four, prepare an occurrence report on the employee. So this is kind of interesting here because this is insinuating, okay? This is insinuating that this nurse possibly may have some sort of what? May have some sort of perhaps substance abuse problem. You know, why are they volunteering to take care of clients who have narcotics? Um, what's going on with that? All right. So what is the best thing for the charge nurse to do? Because remember, this isn't just a coworker. This is actually um, somebody who has a small amount of authority over this nurse, right? Because this is the charge nurse that we're talking about. So what's the best thing for the charge nurse to do in this situation? Oh, I see a lot of people saying number one. A, it's number one. I see some people saying number two. I see some people saying number two, number two. Um, a possible three, possible three. <laughs> All right. Um, and then even some fours. So we're kind of, we are kind of uh, thinking really what is the best thing. And you know, one of the benefits of coming here is that we can clear up any source of confusion that we all have. And we can, um, if we get this kind of question on NCLEX, we will do so much better. This is Love Your Content Week here at Remar Review. So we are loving the content here and we're talking about it. The correct answer for the substance abuse possible possible staff member with a substance abuse problem is number one. Okay. Number one, you guys got it. Congratulations. <laughs> Discuss the nurse's actions with the unit manager. Yes. The thing that would clear up all the confusion about this employee, the thing that would clear up all the confusion about this employee is a simple drug test. It's a simple urine toxicology screen to test for opioids. Unfortunately, the charge nurse doesn't have that authority to say, hey, go down to employee health, I need you to do a drug screen. The charge nurse doesn't have that ability, but the unit manager does, the unit manager does. So the charge nurse needs to take all of the objective data it, to the unit manager, all right? And that's gonna be the best way to handle this situation. Let's look at the other options. Two, confront the nurse. Well, you guys know we never, never, never confront anybody. It's very aggressive. All right. This is not going to be the this is not going to be the time, the appropriation to be confronting anyone. All right. Um, three, do not allow the nurses to take to do not do not allow the nurse to take break alone. Um, no, nurses have a right to take breaks without their peers. OK. And then some people pick four which is prepare an occurrence report on the employee. And just a reminder, when you do an occurrence report or incident report, um, this is not an appropriate reason to do one. Usually the incident reports or the occurrence reports involve the clients, all right, involve the patients. 
and how they have been affected by their health care, the health care that was provided to them. So this is not going to be a reason to to do a, a current report. Are we all clear? OK. All right. <laughs> BT all the way. Here we go. All right. Question number three. I like that comment. <clears throat> a little prioritization for you guys. Which client should the nurse in the surgical care unit assess first? Is it, number one, the client who received general anesthesia for a brain tumor who is complaining of a sore throat? Two, the client who had lower back surgery and has a pulse oximeter reading of 91%. Three, the client who received a new kidney and has a palpable 2 plus dorsalis pedal pulse. Or four, the client who had stomach surgery and has green bile draining from the nasal gastric tube. Okay, guys, here we go. I'm gonna give you some time to just let that sink in. All right. And I want you to tell me who is the priority patient here? Who is the priority patient? Okay. Mm, this is a good one because you have, you have a lot of, you have a lot of different, you know, patients going on. All right. You have a lot of different patients going on here and they are all different. They're all different. So what do you think? What do you guys think? Oh, I got so many people who are saying, isn't it obvious? It's number one. Yes, it's number one. And that seems like, or some people are saying number four too. Some people are saying number four too. They, um, they're worried about it. All right. They are worried about it. What are you guys, what are you guys thinking? <laughs> all right. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. The correct answer, the correct answer actually is, you're going to be shocked or you're going to thank me. If you see something like this on NCLEX, this was an easy one. Everybody should have got it right. Everybody should have picked number two because that pulse oximeter reading is 91%. I don't want a patient with 91% saturation. I want that saturation to be what? I want that saturation to be 93. I want that saturation to be 94, 95, 96. I need it to be a little bit higher, all right? I need it to be a little bit higher. 91% is low, you guys, all right? Did you get it right? Did you get it right? And this is very important because this is essentially a basic airway breathing circulation. I mean, there's there are some things that we as nurses have to be able to identify. And one of the things, one of the things are those, e like when we're taking NCLEX, let's get the easy ones right away. Let's not get the easy ones hard. And I say this is an easy one because if we look at the other patients, they are having, they are having expected, they are having expected, um, signs, clinical signs of what they've been through. Okay. So somebody who had general anesthesia for a brain tumor, who is complaining of a sore throat, that is totally expected because when you get general anesthesia, what happens when you get a general anesthesia, what does general anesthesia do? Okay. So local anesthesia, local anesthesia numbs one area. Right. So just one area is numb. But if somebody gets a general anesthesia, what is that going to do to them? Number one, that's going to put them totally under. OK, you're going to be put under. And normally, because you're put under, what will you get? You'll get some breathing assistance. You'll be put on a ventilator. Right. Just think about patients who have open heart surgery, um, you know, and they have to be put under. All right. So when you get general anesthesia, you don't have the breathing assistance that you normally have when you're awake. So you're usually given some sort of ventilation. So once they remove that ventilation from your throat, how does your throat feel? Oh, it's, it's quite sore. It's quite sore. 
So that's expected, right? Um, three, new kidney. You have a good pedal pulse. We're happy about that. There's no reason I'm coming for that. Um, four, may have gotten a little people off, may have thrown you off a little bit because I put here green bile. Hmm. Well, guess what? Guess what? It is, it is going to be a normal finding. All right. Um, so the NG tube can pull out fluids. Your gastric fluids can range in color between light yellow to green due to the presence of bile. Yes, sometimes bile can cause a green stomach fluid, all right? And so that is normal. That is going to be normal. So this is what I mean when I say it really, when you're doing the virtual trainer or when you're taking NCLEX, your content is what's gonna help you get these tricky questions. And there, there wasn't really a strategy here. It was just, do you know the normals of basic pathophysiology, basic human conditions, all right? Basic procedures. So you have to know what general anesthesia indicates for a patient, all right? You have to know what comes out of the normal gastric fluids. And this is not, uh, the thing about this is this is not senior level nursing stuff. This is fundamentals, integrated concepts. The very first thing you learn in anatomy, what color is gastric fluid supposed to be? All right. So that's why guys, it's good for you to be here today because we go over everything. I'm going to give you another question. Um, if you like what you're seeing, if you like what we're doing, don't forget this week, we have another free class on Wednesday and Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern time right here. If you haven't signed up for the free class, we're going over more content. It's going to help you pass NCLEX. You can go to the website, remarnurse.com forward slash L-O-V-E. We love you guys around here um, as well. And this is to help to spark off the $169 for the NCLEX virtual trainer. And that's on sale until this Friday. All right. BT with 90 day access. I'm putting this out here because I don't want you guys to miss this free class. It's two days. All right. So two days with me, you guys, I don't do it very often, but when I do, it's extremely beneficial and I don't want you to miss out on this content. Okay. So let's look at another question. I'm so glad you're here. Oh my goodness. Here we go. Question number four. Okay. The client with an above the knee amputation has a large amount of bright red blood on the residual limb dressing and the nurse suspects an arterial bleed. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? Is it number one, increase the client's intravenous rate? Two, assess the client's vital signs. Three, apply a tourniquet above the amputation. Or four, notify the healthcare provider. What should the nurse do here? You have a situation, a client has an above the knee amputation, okay? There is a large amount of bright, bright red blood on the dressing. The nurse is suspecting an arterial bleed. What is the intervention that is most needed right now? What do you guys think? Okay. All right. Hello. Hello, everybody. Here we go. Even still mixed answers. That's all right. There's almost 800 nurses. There's over 800. There's almost 900 nurses right now. We are passing NCLEX around these parts. Answer is, uh, this is not a select all that apply. I don't want to there. Here we go. The correct answer is going to apply a tourniquet mutation. okay? And this is going to help do what? It is going to help decrease that bleeding because you have an arterial bleed. If this is in fact an arterial bleed, oh my goodness, how are we going to, how are we, how do you, how do you, how do you stop an arterial bleed? How do you stop an artery that is bleeding out, that has been severed, right? Most of the time you have to burn it. You have to cauterize the, the artery, right? 
So, but in the meantime, because the nurse is not going to pull out a lighter and do that. In the meantime, there is something you can do for your patient. And I really want you guys to think about this because a lot of people pick notify the healthcare provider. That is not correct. And usually that is not going to be correct on your NCLEX exam because that insinuates that you leave the patient in whatever condition they're in to go to the telephone. All right. And so if you have a patient that is potentially bleeding out, all right, blood is just coming out, right? You say, I'll be back. Let me go call a doctor. All right. That means that you're incapable, you're incapable of handling the situation. All right. And that can't be possible because you're a trained clinician. All right. So what you do is you put a tourniquet on that limb first because that's going to reduce the bleeding. And then you can go call the doctor and you can tell the doctor what you have done. If you call the doctor, if you leave the patient that you suspect has an arterial bleed and you call the doctor and the doctor takes 10 minutes to get back to you, right? Because you're, you can't, you, you're not going to do anything. You're waiting for the doctor. All right. That's what that insinuates is if you leave the patient, that means that you don't know how to act until you get an order from the doctor. And so the doctor takes 10, 15 minutes to call you back and you're there waiting for the patient. What's happening this whole time? Massive amounts of blood loss. The patient's just bleeding out from an, arter from an artery. All right, it's an arterial bleed. So when you get back to that patient, how much worse could they have been? How much worse are they gonna be? Because they've been bleeding out for 10 minutes. Hypovolemic shock, all right? All because you didn't put a tourniquet on the patient before you left. So it's very essential. I mean, it's, it's very essential to demonstrate on NCLEX that you are not going to kill a person, all right? The patient has to be safe. If you want a nursing license, you, you got to know the basics, all right? You got to know the basics. So everything about this patient, everything about this question was to demonstrate that you will take care of your patient in an emergency situation and not and not leave them. So number one, if you increase the inner, if you increase that IV fluid, then that means that you pick the machine before your patient. Okay. Uh, number two, the vital signs mean nothing. I don't care about the vital signs right now. Not at all important. Okay. And then number four, don't pass off the responsibility to somebody else. Stay with that patient. Do something for that patient. Okay. The doctor is not there. The doctor actually at this moment cannot help the patient. All right. And Asanya, I see your comment. I'm so sorry to read that. I'm so sorry to read that. And, it, you know, I don't always agree with the ink. There is a really great uh, purpose for being able to demonstrate that you are a safe nurse. And so when we come here every week, we have a good time. You know, we have a good time, we study and we make jokes and things like that. But really, at the end of it, you guys may very well be in a situation or something even greater than this. And it is literally the knowledge that you possess now that will carry you to save somebody's life. All right. And so um, we take education very seriously here. We take studying these questions very serious because I don't want my family member being taken care of by a nurse who will leave them if they are bleeding out from somewhere. I don't want that to happen to my family member. And so I want to make sure that we're all on the same level. All right. We're all on the same level about what we know. All right. Let's try another question, shall we? OK, let's try another question. Um, here we go here. Oh, this is a great one. All right. Number five. The nurse enters an empty client room and the unlicensed assistive personnel is changing a full sharps container. Which action should the nurse implement? Okay. 
So in just, just to go again, the nurse enters an empty patient room and the aide is changing the sharps container. The sharps container is full. Which action should the nurse implement? Is it number one, tell the unlicensed assistive personnel she cannot change the sharps container? Two, explain the housekeeping department changes the sharps container. Okay. Three, acknowledge the positive behavior and thank the unlicensed assistive personnel, okay? Or four, write the unlicensed assistive personnel up for working outside the scope of practice, okay? Here we go. What do you guys think here? All right, and if you are just joining us, we are on question number five, and we are doing Let's Talk NCLEX here. This is Monday. This is what we do around here. We study for NCLEX. All right. So what do you guys say about this? I'm sure people are like, what? Where did this question come from? All right. Where did this question come from? All right. And I will tell you where this question came from. It came from <laughs> the it, it just came from, you know, a very special place I like to call my imagination. And I want to I want to get you guys ready to see things like this on your NCLEX exam, all right? And what are you gonna do about it, all right? Okay, so the correct answer here, guys, the correct answer <laughs> is going to be, um, are you ready for it? Okay, the correct answer is going to be number, Number three, yes, it's number three. We are going to thank that unlicensed assistive personnel for changing the sharps container. Anybody, okay, all hospital staff are trained to change the sharps container. It is a matter of safety, all right? And it's not that difficult to do. It's not that complicated, right? We know that there's it's locked. So you just unlock the box, pull out the encasing because all of the sharps actually go into a sealed container, right? You just pull it out, all right? You take it where your facility says to put them and you replace it with an empty reservoir for the needles. But I have some more teaching to do on it. Just in case you get this on NCLEX, you're sure gonna be glad that you studied with Remar Review, all right? So remember guys, all Sharps disposable containers should be made up. And these look very, these look very familiar. I've only seen them look like this. All right. Um, made of a heavy duty plastic. No, you don't need a you don't need the uh, biohazard team to do to do it. Um, so they're all made of heavy duty plastic. Um, they should be tight fitting, puncture proof. Right. And the sharps are not able to come out. The sharps are not able to come out once they're put in. And so that's what makes it safe. Right. That's what makes it safe. And and I know, listen, so I'm telling you guys what you need to know for your NCLEX exam. Remember, it's not about what you're doing in your hospital. It's not about what you're doing in your hospital. It's about what what has what has um, been approved by JACO in terms of who can do it. So you don't need a license in order to change a sharps container. Housekeeping staff can do it. It literally guys, trust me on this. All right. If you go by what you're doing in your hospital, you may not do as well as you could do. All right. So here we go. Upright and stable during use. They should, Sharps containers should also be leak resistant and properly labeled. All right. Leak resistant and properly labeled. Um, and remember, remember here that if you see this question on NCLEX, the Sharps container position should be 52 to 56 inches above the standing surface of the user. So the main point is that you're able to see, all right, you're able to see the Sharp going down into the container properly, all right? And um, the studies have shown that 52 to 56 inches is the appropriate length for about 95% of all female healthcare workers. So I guess the idea is 
um, that the male workers would be taller than this anyways, but this is the standard. So no, this height, 52, um, 52 to 56 inches. All right. And some of you guys may, uh, some of you guys may be like, well, um, we do it a little bit differently. <laughs> uh, so I'm just, I'm just going over, you know, what I know, what I want to share with you guys. You can take it or you can leave it. Um, but I suggest you take it for your NCLEX exam. All right. So that's all I have to say about that. I sure hope you enjoyed studying today and I sure hope that you learned something new. All right. Learn something new. Uh, I had a great time. Again, if you really like studying and going over questions, we have an amazing opportunity to do that this week, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, for the Love Your Content Review, February 12th, February 13th. We're going to be doing it at night. So 8 p.m. Eastern time. Again, if you have the ability to download this workbook before Wednesday, do so. Do so because we're going to have a great time going over this content. All right. We just have another part of our Monday motivation slash Let's Talk NCLEX. So we did the Let's Talk NCLEX. Let's get into the motivation right here. I have some good stuff for you. What determines your future? People want to know this. You're taking NCLEX. You're getting ready to pass it. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. What determines your future? future. All right. So experts say this, like 90% of our daily behavior is based off of our habits. All right. Can you agree with that? Most of what you do is habitual. It's based off of habits that you have developed. And about most of your day is that, right? So you have a habit for what you do in the morning when you wake up. You have a habit for how you drive to work, the route you take, most people do not take a new route to work every day. We mostly take the same route over and over. Also, how you pay your bills, whether you like to pay them on, online, whether you like to send in checks, whether you like to pay them late. Some people just pay their bills late every month because it's just their habit. And then also what you do with your free time. Are you scrolling on the gram or are you watching Netflix? Whatever it is. All right. So I want us to put a focus on that because it is literally what we do every day is literally our habits that we have every day that actually determine our future. And we can say that for NCLEX. If we're studying every day, like we just did for the last, what, 45 minutes, we have a better chance of passing NCLEX, right? But if we don't take it seriously, if you're not really taking your NCLEX studying seriously and you're doing it whenever you feel like it and not when you're supposed to, when you get on the exam, that day, you're not going to feel as confident. You're going to know that there are some things that you just didn't study and you just didn't commit to. And so I wanted to remind you guys that what you are doing on a daily basis, whatever your habit is regarding NCLEX is going to determine your future with that thing, right? So what you're doing today will determine your future with that thing. And it's just a principle because the you always end up where you put your focus, you always end up where you put your focus. And we get that so much in our testimonials where we hear people say, you know what? I'm studying every day, okay? I'm studying every day and I'm ready to pass this NCLEX. Your future is determined by the habits of today. It's very simple. It's a simple motivation for you guys. What we're doing today will determine where we'll be when it's time to take NCLEX. And it's the same thing with other things in your life. The goals that you have, your fitness goals, your health goals. If you're working out today in the future, you're probably going to lose that weight you wanted to lose. But if you're not working out today and you're eating junk and you're just, you know, passively whatever, then you're probably not going to lose the weight that you want to lose. Right. I'm speaking to my own self, not to you guys here. But in the end, if 2020 is our year, it's the same thing I said last year, uh, last week and last year, too, probably. If 2020 is going to be your year, you're going to have to do something about it. You're going to have to participate. There's going to have to be a sacrifice if you want it to be your year. This is not just about to be your year because you say it is. It doesn't work like that. It's your year because you're putting forth the effort, because you're making the time, because you're making the commitment. Everybody should be at this review Wednesday and Thursday. Because if NCLEX is important to you, you'll make this a priority to be in class, all right? So you can hear from my words or you can hear from our Remar nurse. She did, the next Remar nurse that I'm showing you guys, she did a review when she got the virtual trainer and 
she did the difference between the virtual trainer and the DVD package. And um, you can watch it on the Facebook page, but guess what? That was just a few weeks ago. And now she comes back and she says this. Hi guys. I had to come back on here to let you guys know that I passed my NCLEX RN to God be the glory, great things he has done. I could not have done it without prayers. I had to get prayed up and just put all my trust in God. I just had to come back to tell, to come back to tell Regina and the Remar family, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all the motivational Mondays. For, the, for all the content on the VT, which made me so much more confident while writing the exam. It's an amazing feeling, guys. Um, just wanna let you guys know that the VT is solid. The VT is solid. The questions, I mean, they really, really make you think. And I personally find that they were pretty similar to the questions I got on the NCLEX, just in terms of, making you, you know, consider every option and just putting you in that mindset to think. And I think that helped me a lot. I mean, I can, I can say that there wasn't a topic on my NCLEX that I did not know. All the topics were familiar. Nothing was foreign to me in terms of the topics. Um, it was more, more so the application of the knowledge that I learned is you know what took a toll on me and made me feel a bit fatigued but with god grace i made it and i just want to encourage everyone to keep going keep studying hard and just do what it takes you know to to get a pass with this exam this exam is difficult but we all will get through we all will make it everybody's time is different but it's more so perseverance and faith is what really got me through. And I just want you guys to know that you, you can do it too. It's funny, but I actually miss Regina's voice. Like just hearing her every day for the past few months, it's like she was like my virtual friend. So now I'm home, I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Like, you know, that part of me of just studying and, and and just being able to just keep him busy. Um, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Remar family. And God bless guys. All the best with your exam. Oh my goodness. I am so, I am really so happy to hear nurse Roshana. Uh, her testimony is phenomenal and it just, it just reflects really the reason why we do what we do here. At Remar review It's so we can, hear many more stories of people saying, I had such a good time. And now that it's over, what am I going to do with myself? And uh, I know a lot of nursing instructors never hear that. And so it's an honor and a privilege for me to see you every time I jump online, you show up and we study together. And that is just an amazing feeling. And it will lead to you passing your NCLEX exam. So I want to see you guys in class this week. We have a class Wednesday and we have a class Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern time. If you're in a different time zone, convert that time so that you can be here with me so that we can continue studying. Uh, it was a great session. This is Monday Motivation. Let's talk NCLEX. I will see you guys later. Bye. Thank you.